My name is Angel Tapia, and I'm the Senior Manager of Hispanic Outreach at Global Healthy Living Foundation, GHLF. I'd like to thank you for tuning in to the Strong Ones and Me Patient Story Series. The Strong Ones and Me Patient Story Series aims to raise awareness on osteoporosis, fracture prevention, and post-fracture care by sharing real-life stories from those that are affected by osteoporosis and the providers who treat them. They will share experiences living with the condition, its effects, methods of prevention, and care in order to help inform and educate others so that living with osteoporosis can still mean living fully, actively, and well. Today, we're joined by Dr. James Carson from Houston, Texas, United States. Dr. Carson joins us to share some of his expert knowledge on orthopedic surgery and bone and joint health. Hi, Dr. Carson. Thank you so much for joining us today. Hello. Good evening. Thank you for having me. Can you tell us a bit about yourself, the work that you do, and what drew you to work in the profession of osteoporosis and bone health? Well, as mentioned, my name is James Carson. Um, I was uh, born and raised in Battle Creek, Michigan, and attended University of Michigan for college. I then went to Johns Hopkins University um, for medical school. Um, I had already decided upon um, orthopedic surgery um, when I was younger because of my love for sports and the proximity of orthopedic surgery to sports and also having had orthopedic surgery while I was in high school because of a broken bone. So I initially thought I was going to do sports medicine. However, during medical school, I had the opportunity to go on a mission trip to Lima, Peru with a, a group called Operation Walk, where we did um, hip and knee replacements on um, as many patients as we could in a 10-day span. I got the opportunity to go on that trip because I uh, can speak Spanish. So I went in order to help translate, but also because I could help in surgery as well. But once I started doing hip and knee replacements there, I fell in love with it. And that led to my current subspecialty in orthopedics, which is adult reconstruction, also known as hip and knee replacement. So I can definitely imagine that experience shaped um, just the interest that you have in making sure that patients' bones are very healthy after um, seeing what can lead them to surgery. And prevention is a big part of that, I'm sure. Um, what are the primary risk factors for developing osteoporosis? So there are multiple risk factors for developing osteoporosis. And we like to separate them into two categories. One category are those that you cannot control. The second category are those that you can control. So some of the things that you cannot control um, are age, that's the number one risk factor. Another one is family history, things that you can't control because uh, there is a genetic component of it. Um, another is exposure to hormones <clears throat> such as estrogen and testosterone. So after going through menopause, women have lower levels of estrogen, which causes weaker bones, uh, which another risk factor is female sex. And uh, there are other controllable risk factors such as diet, um, your exposure to vitamin D and calcium, especially at a younger age when your bones are uh, still being built, consumption of alcohol, which can cause weaker bones, activity level. Um, so lower activity level leads to increased risk of osteoporosis. So you say some of the factors can be hereditary and are things that um, can cause osteoporosis to be onset or to become more severe. Um, what are preventative measures that people can do to prevent the risk of getting osteoporosis? So things people can do to prevent it, like I said, especially in younger age, having diets, healthy diets consisting of good amounts of calcium and vitamin D. Uh, increased activity level, even this extends even to older age. So having higher activity levels throughout life can uh, 
help prevent it. Um, one of the risks is um, essentially being very skinny and of small stature. So that can partially be controlled with diet. Of course, genetics also plays a role in that, though. And then other things are just known fall prevention measures. So as we get older, our balance is not as good and our strength is not as good. So making sure um, things around the house are arranged in the optimum way to decrease your risk of taking a fall. And with the things that are possible to help us prevent osteoporosis um, and knowing that there are some things that just aren't um, possible for us to prevent that could be genetics. Um, and like you said, some of those dispositions that we might not have control over. Um, what are some of the latest treatments that are available for those who are diagnosed with osteoporosis? So for people who are diagnosed with osteoporosis, the um, baseline treatment or usually the first line treatment is within a class of drugs called bisphosphonates. And what bisphosphonates do is decrease the uh, rate of resorption of bones. So in normal, healthy bones, especially in younger people, the bones are constantly being absorbed and having new bone laid down. And this is a constant cycle. However, in osteoporosis, the rate of absorption of bone becomes higher than new bone being laid down. So what the bisphosphonate drugs do is to slow down that rate that the bones are being absorbed at. So that's the, uh, the first line treatment. There are multiple different bisphosphonates and that's usually decided in conjunction of you know, with between the patient and their primary care doctor. There's another class of drugs that uh, is used in people with severe osteoporosis and who are at higher fracture risk. And those drugs um, use parathyroid hormone. So there are uh, monoclonal antibodies, drugs that have been developed in which... Uh, they work through parathyroid hormone, and they also work by slowing down the resorption of bone. But those drugs also have the added benefit of increasing the production of new bone. So in people with severe osteoporosis, those drugs actually help the bones get stronger. So for those patients that are taking medication and things that can help assist with making their bones stronger and avoiding fractures. Um, is there anything um, secondary that can assist them as well? So for example, I know that there are um, physical therapies that can be helpful um, for patients, especially after they've recovered from a fracture. Is that something that you think is just important that overall bone health um, to help maintain healthy bones and then also after someone has had a surgery or procedure? Oh, absolutely. So physical therapy is a mainstay of treatment in patients um, before or after they uh, had a uh, what we call a fragility fracture or a fracture caused by osteoporosis. So essentially, physical therapy does a couple of things. One, it increases activity level, which helps with the formation of bone. Two, it increases strength and balance, which helps prevent people from falling. So physical therapy is absolutely important in the treatment of osteoporosis before or after um, a fracture has occurred. And how often do osteoporosis patients experience fractures and what bones are most likely to be affected? So the, um, the bones that are most likely to be affected by osteoporosis are the uh, vertebra or the uh, backbones, the distal radius or the wrist bone, and the proximal femur, which is the thigh bone. And the proximal part means um, around the hip. So these are the most common um, 
bones to be affected. There are um, differing numbers when it comes to the rates of uh, fragility fractures. In 50 plus year olds, there are, the rate of osteoporosis is about 15%. And then people over 80 years old, the rate of osteoporosis is about 70%. And of those who actually sustain fractures is about, uh, I want to say 30, around 30% of those people who have osteoporosis. And when we talk about osteoporosis, we always think about the bone. Um, and I think it's so important to also mention the effects that it can have on the joints. Can you share a little bit about that connection? Yeah, essentially, because the bone in general is weaker, it can, uh, it can lead to higher rates of arthritis within the joints. Of course, arthritis is mainly modulated by cartilage health. However, the health of the cartilage, it depends upon the bone which it sits upon. So people with osteoporosis get higher uh, rates of um, arthritis. And additionally, for someone like me who replaces those joints, I have to take their bone health into account when I'm deciding how or what type of implant I'm going to use to replace those joints. Talking about some of the joint and bone uh, replacements that you've done and knowing how that can affect patients um, just after recovery, what are some of the procedures and advancements that there have been for um, surgery and treatments for osteoporosis? So for people who have sustained fractures, um, I can say that we, we probably in orthopedics haven't developed new tools per se, but just through collecting evidence over a lot of years of treating this, we understand uh, best practices of treating them. Uh, for instance, if we're doing a partial hip replacement for a femoral neck fracture in an osteoporotic person, uh, we know that the long-term outcomes are better now with cemented uh, femoral implants compared to the standard ones that we would use, which are press fit. It shows a, uh, a lower risk of subsequent fractures in the future. That's probably one of the most common treatments that we do for this. So it's important. Um, and another is just improving the quality of some of the implants we've had. There are uh, another step down, which is intertrochanteric or subtrochanteric femur fractures. So we treat them with a type of implant called a cephalomedullary nail, which is a nail that goes inside of the bone. It goes down inside of the femur. Plus it also goes, has screws that go up into the femoral neck. And we know for people with osteoporosis, the fixation isn't quite as strong. So there have been implants developed that have essentially a greater amount of fixation or using the ones with the same amount of fixation, but injecting a type of bone cement that makes that fixation even stronger. It's great that there's a lot of options available for patients. And do you see a difference in diagnosis and fracture rates amongst different populations in terms of maybe health disparities, um, things that might be facing the BIPOC community? So um, there are health disparities within the realm of osteoporosis. One, minorities, especially minority women, are less likely to be screened for osteoporosis, meaning they're less likely to have a DEXA scan ordered in order to even know if they have it. Even afterwards, they're less likely to have pharmacological treatment for osteoporosis. And finally, once people have sustained a fracture, post-fracture, they're less likely to be treated for osteoporosis, which puts them at higher risk of subsequent fragility fractures. 
Yes, I know it definitely affects women. So thank you for sharing that and making sure that there is a highlight for the importance of um, awareness and screening for um, women and especially women of color. Can you share some of these success stories of patients recovering from fractures, perhaps how they've successfully prevented another fracture? Luckily, I have many success stories um, because I uh, do a lot of trauma surgery in a, a tertiary care hospital. Step one is getting them to surgery as soon as possible and getting them back on their feet. So especially with hip fractures, unless there's a medical reason why they can't, they go to surgery within 24 hours and get physical therapy at least the day after surgery, getting getting them up on their feet. Beyond that, um, they, they go to rehab and at least as many as possible go to inpatient rehab uh, so that they can start recovering and get stronger before they have to go home into a less monitored environment. Another thing they do within rehab is try to send an occupational therapist to the home with the family before the patient gets out in order to make the home safer. Doing things like getting rid of throw rugs and stuff like that, anything that can be a trip hazard, even helping them to rearrange the house in a way that's safer. Once outside of the uh, hospital, I tried to uh, get in, uh, maintain contact with their primary care doctor uh, because they're the ones that coordinate the actual osteoporosis care. So usually just because they come see me before their primary care, I try to order a uh, DEXA scan for anyone who hasn't been diagnosed uh, so that they can have those results before they go to their primary care doctor. And then, um, like I said earlier, the medication that they end up being treated on is a joint decision between the patient and their primary care doctor. Thank you, Dr. Carson. Your insight has been very helpful in showing us the importance of bone joint health, uh, along with just the effects of osteoporosis and fractures. I am honored that you are a practicing surgeon here in Houston, Texas, and that you serve our amazing community with your rich experience and devoted patient care. Thank you. Have a great night. Thank you again for tuning into GHLF's Strong Bones and Me Patient Story Series. There is a lot of power and knowledge and sharing, especially from different cultures and walks of life. And we hope that these stories help all of us remember that strong bones mean a strong meat.